Brock and the Dragon Story by Robin Klein Pictures by Rodney McRae Brock and the Dragon Brock and the Dragon Story by Robin Klein Pictures by Rodney McRae Sir Swithin had three sons Bertolf, Berthold and Brock Bertolf became a knight and rode off in his new armour glittering like a Christmas tree he returned after having slain a score of dragons and rescuing dozens of maidens in distress. Berthold became a knight also, and performed many noble deeds. He also rescued dozens of maidens in distress. Well done, my sons said Sir Swithin. He gave each of them a magnificent castle and their very own peasants to order around. The third son, Brock, grew to the age where he too could become a knight. I don't want to, thanks very much, he said. Sir Swithin was struck speechless. I hate wearing armour. It's beastly hot inside and the view's limited, said Brock, and I don't care much for going after dragons either. He was apparently not even embarrassed that archers, knights, and pages, ladies-in-waiting, and several hound dogs were all staring at him in shock. The Swithins have always produced the finest knights in the country, his father said furiously. I order you to go out into the forest and slay at least one dragon and rescue at least one maiden in distress. I'd much rather stay home and play my lute, said Brock. Dragon or dungeon, choose, said Sir Swithin grimly. Brock rather sulkily climbed into his armour and onto his horse. He wasn't a very good rider and promptly fell off the other side. The archers ran to hoist him on again, smirking. Don't dare come back without rescuing a maiden from a dragon, ordered Sir Swithin. I don't actually have to get close enough to kill it, do I? Brock pleaded. Can't I just toss a few stones into its cave from a distance? But his father had slammed shut the portcullis and was glaring threateningly through it the slits. Brock rode off into the dark forest, not enjoying it at all. He saw several maidens in distress, but as he was such a poor rider, by the time he managed to point his horse in the right direction, some other knight had always got there first. He passed a castle and yelled out a half-hearted challenge for someone to come out and fight, but a pail of cold tea was tipped over him from the battlements. At last he came to a place where there was a pretty maiden chained to a rock. I'm Lady Evadne. This year's sacrifice to the local dragon, she said. It's a terrible one, so I hope your sword is good and sharp. I'm afraid it's a bit rusty, said Brock. I'm not very keen on fighting. Oh, well, a sword wouldn't be much use on this dragon anyhow, said Lady Evadne. It just snaps them like matches. It's already eaten dozens of yearly sacrifices. Brock took off his helmet to look at her properly. She was truly fair. Her eyes were sky blue, her hair fell like liquid gold to her waist, and she had a nice little nose with freckles on it. It seemed a terrible pity that she had to be a sacrifice. Perhaps I could break that chain and we'll get away before the dragon comes, he said. I've already tried that, said Lady of Adney. I brought along this file, but the chain's too thick. I brought along a good hefty stick, too, and this pile of stones for ammunition. 
I certainly don't intend to be a meek little sacrifice like Lady Arabella last year and all the other girls before her. Aren't you supposed to be pale and trembling? Brock asked in surprise. I quite enjoy a good fight, said Lady Evadne. Besides, you're pale and trembling enough for both of us. I'd much rather be a musician than a knight, Brock confessed. Shall I play you something on my lute to take your mind off the dragon? Nothing could. This dragon is as long as a scummy moat, and its teeth are like coral reefs. Its claws are as sharp as swords, and it makes the most hideous roaring sound you've ever heard in your life. Brock paled even more. I expect it will be along any minute now, said Lady of Adney, resignedly. The quiet of the forest was broken suddenly by a dreadful roaring. The air grew hot and leaves on nearby trees crumpled like burning envelopes. Here it comes, said Lady of Adney, as she picked up one of the stones. Have no fear, I shall save you, said Brock, trembling in his armour. I'm not frightened, said Lady of Adney, rather crushingly. I can look after myself very well. The dragon trembled grumpily through the forest. It actually detested the taste of humans, and resented having to come out of its cave on assignments such as this. The sacrificial maidens were always heaped with gold jewellery, and gold gave him indigestion but one couldn't very well go against tradition. It burst out of the forest in a flurry of snapping branches and crushed tree trunks. Gack! It roared threateningly, though without much enthusiasm. Just as it thought, gold ornaments, dozens of them. It shot out a bright orange flame. Brock's sword bent like cooked spaghetti. The horse took fright and ran away, and Brock found himself at the top of a tall tree without having been aware of having climbed it. Lady of Adney threw a stone. She had an excellent aim from playing cricket with the pages instead of sewing a fine seam. The stone, however, bounced off the dragon's scales like a ping-pong ball off concrete. Lady of Adney used all the stones from her ammunition pile. Then she picked up a stick and dealt the dragon a thumping blow on its snout. Serves you right, you ugly great bully, she said fiercely. The dragon opened its mouth to devour her. Brock could hardly bear to watch. He remembered reading somewhere that wild beasts could be tamed by music, so he took out his lute and began to play a ballad of his own composition. He sang the first verse and Lady of Adney and the dragon paused to listen. They could hardly do otherwise. Brock had a mighty baritone voice that could penetrate even through stone castle walls, as his father and brothers could testify. But in truth, his singing voice and musical ability were in the same class as his knightmanship, that is to say, verily dreadful and pitiful. Every bird in the countryside shot startled into the air, and rabbits dived into their burrows and huddled in their deepest corners with their paws over their ears. The dragon recoiled and slunk rapidly back into its cave in the forest. It packed all its belongings and spread its vast wings and left the neighbourhood forever. Thousands of years later it still had nightmares about Brock's terrible lute playing and horrible singing voice. "'What a lovely song,' said Lady of Adney, who was tone deaf. "'You sing beautifully, and how clever, charming a dragon with music. No other knight ever thought of doing that.' Her father arrived to lament the loss of his daughter, but she was alive and well. The dragon's breath had melted the chain and she was busy rounding up Brock's horse, since he was so hopeless at it. Lady of Adney's father was delighted to find that the fearsome dragon had at last been vanquished. He offered Brock Lady of Adney's hand in marriage. Though you might prefer another maiden, he whispered tactfully in Brock's ear. If Adney's not very good at sewing. She's always out in the forest hunting wild pigs. I think she's perfectly lovely, said Brock. 
He took Lady Evadne back to his father, and Sir Swithin gave him a magnificent castle and his very own peasants to order around. However, all the peasants ran off because they couldn't stand Brock singing and lute playing. But Lady Evadne absolutely adored it. <laughs> 